Welcome to the Sibling Rivalry panel with three guests who are parent coaches and parents themselves sharing their amazing wisdom, mostly around some form of conscious parenting and attachment theory. Those are sort of the primary bodies of wisdom that we've tapped into here. I am super impressed with everyone that's on this panel. You will hear from them. They'll introduce themselves so you'll know a little bit about them. One of my hopes is to expose people to wonderful coaches who are available for you to be able to get some support from on your parenting journey. Sibling rivalry and sibling conflict can be really truly one of the things that causes us to feel like our home is not harmonious and to feel like we're struggling to make it through every single day and it contributes to a tremendous amount of parent guilt so please watch listen in and reach out to these amazing coaches if you feel like you want some additional support thank you so much and i can't wait to hear what you think about this Hello everyone, this is Deb Blum here and I am super excited to be launching this sibling rivalry, sibling conflict panel, the first of three. And we have three amazing guests today and I'm gonna actually allow them to introduce themselves. And we're going to start, um, uh, I'm gonna start with Tia and then Tia, you can just pass it along to somebody else after you're done. All right, sounds good. So um, I'm Tia Fagan, I'm based out of Wisconsin. And I'm a conscious parent coach certified with Dr. Shafali and uh, Jai Institute. And I just help parents and families and individuals, you know, tap into their inner knowing and helping families create more connection and then connection with yourself, with your children and whatever else shows up, whoever I work with. It's, there's no set program. It just is what it is. So That's I like, cool. I love helping people. Very cool. And, and how old are your kids? I have two twin, well, obviously twin daughters who are 19 years old. And so freshmen in college who are now back home with uh, COVID. Great. Thanks. And can you pass it along? Uh, Kelly, you're right below me on my screen. So. Oh, okay. My name is Kelly Hedgeson and I'm a child counselor and teacher and life coach. And I help moms to get their kids to listen without ever having to yell and repeat themselves 150 times and to not sleep with mommy guilt. That is my goal every single day is to love the mom that they are and get connection with their kids versus all this chaos and arguing and fighting. So I try to create harmony in the home by helping the parents because I know when I help the parents then I'm actually helping the kids because kids are really my passion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. And, and your kids, did you say you didn't say? Oh, I have a nine-year-old little boy. Well, he's not, he wouldn't like to be called little. Nine <laughs> and a half and a just new 12-year-old girl. So they have been my greatest teachers. And I thought with all of my, you know, degrees and everything that I brought to the table, I thought parenting was going to be kind of easy because I was a teacher for so many years and it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. So I kind of talk about that journey of the before and after process of how hard it was for me and how the conscious parent just completely rocked my heart wide open. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. And Terry, you're next on my screen. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Terry Chiapetta. I'm uh, from um, Montreal, in Canada. Uh, I'm, I have three amazing children. Uh, they have been my greatest teachers and uh, they have led me to conscious parenting so much so that I became a conscious parent coach um, with uh, certified by Dr. Shafali and so my goal is basically to just help parents uh, connect with themselves and more importantly uh, empower and connect with their children so that's what I'm here for. Great thank you so much. All right great well and I have two boys they are 17 and 16 and um, so I, I think we're just gonna jump right in. And I, when I think about sibling rivalry, I think about pretty much, I think it really kind of encompasses everything. It's funny, when I, when I thought about doing this, I was thinking like sibling fighting, sibling conflict, sibling bickering, it seems like sometimes sibling rivalry feels like it's a little bit more like when it gets to an extreme place for people. And so I think we're going to probably dancing, be dancing in all of that today because some of it, it's hard. And it's also hard to know, like, when is it tipped to the point where it's 
it's something that's a problem versus when it's just healthy, kind of normal interaction. So maybe we'll get into some of that too. Um, but before we even go into that, I thought maybe each of you guys would maybe share your perception of like, what is sibling rivalry? And then what is it that you think is happening underneath it? You know, cause there's a whole, there are a whole bunch of behaviors that manifest and we call them sibling rivalry or sibling conflict, but then there's like, what's going on? So I'm um, Kelly, would you be willing to start? Sure. Um, when I became, I was having a lot of conflict within my own home between my two kids. And I was also having a lot of conflict with my kids in general. And I found once I became a conscious parent, I realized I was actually dropping the set of me against you energy because it was always me against my daughter and it was there was so much friction. And once I became a conscious parent, I realized I was like putting the tug of war down and there was no place for her to pull, so, so to speak. And so once I learned how to become a conscious parent, then I learned how to teach those same skills to her that it's not because she and her brother were fighting all the time and I couldn't understand it. But the reason why what was underneath it is that she felt like it was her against him. And it was this inner battle between the two of them. And once I taught them almost like how to become a conscious sister and conscious brother, because she always said when she would get so triggered by him getting upset. And I said, what does that bother you so much? And she says, I sometimes just feel like I'm the worst sister ever. Mm -hmm. And so I realized that it was like, she was feeling it was she against him. And he was feeling like, well, I'm going to, it's me against you. And they were always in that conflict, so to speak. And when you kind of teach them how to drop the tug of war and they're on the same team and you teach it through kind of like doing it the way I'm interacting with Lily, my son is watching. So he doesn't know what to do. So sometimes when you get underneath it, the behavior is just a symptom to the problem. And so when you are always treating the symptoms and the, and the consequences, consequences, then it's just almost like if you, if a child has a rash and you're always treating the rash, but not getting to the root of what is the child eating that's causing the rash. Yeah. So when you get to the root and underneath it, they generally feel like it's me against them and I'm going to, I'm going to win at any cost. So once you kind of diffuse that and, and realize and let them know that they're not, it's not them against each other, it's them with each other, then you'll see that the tug of war stops and then they kind of figure out how to, how to navigate together, so to speak. Yeah. Thank you for that. And it, you know, it's funny because that's like the dream, right? That's what people, like everybody has the dream, like that we're going to create a relationship with their, our siblings, that they're going to have mm -hmm. life, you know, lifelong connection and that they're going to be able to um, be connected and be buds. And what I hear you saying, just to like, uh, I explain or tell me if this doesn't seem right, but it seems like mm -hmm. what you're saying is like, you helped to teach them how to be in conflict with one another, but in a conscious way, in a compassionate way. So mm -hmm. you took it as an opportunity to help to teach them how to be in relationship with one another. Yeah. Cause they're always watching us and they don't know yeah. what to do when they're feeling stressed. So they say, okay, what does mom, what do mom and dad do when they're arguing? So it really happens from the top down. Like how do my husband and I handle conflict? Cause there always is going to be conflict. I think sometimes we're so afraid of conflict. But if we go into conflict of like, we're on family feud, we're all on the same team. It's not me against you going up against the buzzer, but we're all on the same team and we're all like going after the same common goal. So it starts from the top down of like, how do mom and dad get along? And then they're going to mirror that. And then also, what am I doing when Lily and I are having a messy moment? Because if mm -hmm. we're having a messy moment and I'm yelling and screaming, then Grady, my son is taking notes. Okay, that's what I should do when my sister makes me mad because that's what mom does. Yeah. Same thing goes when I'm working with Grady during a messy moment, he's having a tantrum or really upset and I'm able to hold the space. She's not even involved, but she's picking up on a, almost through osmosis unconsciously in the other room. Okay. This is what I should do when I'm stressed out with my mm -hmm. brother. Yeah. And so giving them strategies because generally they don't know how to get along. They're with each other all the time. And especially in this quarantine, it's like whatever was happening before is now only amplified. And so it kind of gives us that we've been pushing it on the rug, pushing it on the rug. Now with this quarantine, it exposes all of it. There is no rug. And now it's all coming up to the surface. And whatever was happening before is just amplified now. Totally. All right. Well, very cool. Thank you very much. That's great. Mm -hmm. We'll get back to that because there's a lot in there. But I just want to make sure that we pass around. So For sure. Um, yeah. So um, Tia, how about you? How about what your experience is with this? Yeah. I mean, I think Kelly said it beautifully. You know, we have to model the behaviors. When we have conflict, how do we handle that? 
Um, the other thing I'll add in, you know, with twins, um, they're the same age. So I don't have the older, younger, and then adding in, I'm an only child. So I don't even, I didn't know what sibling rivalry was. I didn't know how to experience. I didn't know how to navigate it. So I already had a couple uh, challenges that I didn't expect, you know. Um, so for me, it was really starting to go within and understand why is their conflict bothering me so much? Why am I having a hard time? What is my expectation in their behavior? Because I had the, you know, you grow up without siblings. So it's like, oh, you watch the TV show, you know, Bill Cosby. Oh, they, do it, they work through it so beautifully. And, right. you know, I mean, I hate to bring up Bill Cosby now, but that's the one of the But he was so good then. <laughs> yes, so exactly. Good. Even though we didn't know about the behind the scenes. But, um, you know, so I had this pie in the sky idea of what siblings were. And, you know, and then you throw in identical twins and it's like, oh, they're going to be this amazing. They're going to flow. They're going to have this communication. I don't understand. And it's going to be beautiful. So I had created this incredible story in my head. Now keep in mind, I was, <laughs> did not have conscious parenting tools when they were younger. Um, and so as they got older and as that need for autonomy grew, then their, their conflict started to really show up and elementary school really when as they started to pull away from me but then they had to pull away from each other and how do you do that when you look in the mirror and you see yourself literally being reflected back at you yeah you know because they're identical so on top of that so there were all these little layers that I didn't understand at the time now I you know having gone through the process of becoming a conscious parent which is ongoing and lifelong um, I recognized when the conflict would arise I would, I could feel myself shrinking and I could feel like the tightness of my throat and my chest. And so it was really about what is my expectation? What do they need? What are they needing from each other? And it became very clear they needed autonomy from each other and having going to a small Montessori school, um, they had no time away from each other. Mm -hmm. So it was starting to create that space, you know, they, then they had their own bedroom. So at least they had their own physical space. So it was meeting those needs underneath and particularly for me, understanding that conflict is normal in a sibling relationship. It's just how we give them those tools to navigate. Um, I mean, one of my daughters beautifully expressed this, I think it was maybe a year ago, and they were having a, quite a big moment of butting heads. And I was talking to her and she's like, mom, it's just, I see in her all the stuff I don't like about myself. Mm, that's and it was like, insightful. wow. <laughs> wow, you know, so talk about going beneath and understanding and for her to have that awareness. It was, you know, it caused an emotional response in me of like pride in a way. It was like, you yeah. see this, yeah. you know, you may not be integrating, but the lessons and the tools are in your foundation and that you could even recognize this. Yeah. So it's so deep and so multi-layered. So you know, backing off of what Kelly said, it's the same type of thing. It's like, it, we are the center. Yeah. And until we can model and embody that, how can we expect our kids? Yep. So true. Yeah. And, and it sounds like, so it was a combination because you really needed to do your work in order to be able to see much more clearly. Because otherwise you were seeing through these, this lens of your expectations and unconscious you know, all kinds of beliefs and thoughts. And so once you clear that away, then you were able to, you had the capacity to say, what's actually going on here? What are their needs? What am I missing here? Right. And, you know, what part, because it's so easy to just see the behavior. And as, as Kelly said, you know, just being like behavior management of like, you know, consequence for this, don't do this, don't do that. Why are you doing that? That's mean, I, you know, it's just this constant and and what an exhausting way to parent. And many of us did before we understood this, you know, and um, we know, <laughs> and then we, you know, we know there's a, another like flip side. And so, but it did take, uh, you know, and I'm sure Kelly, you know, I know your path enough to know that it took you doing that too. It, you know, it's the self-awareness mm -hmm. that start, that's the, that's first, the first step. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And Terry, what are your thoughts on this? Wow. I don't know what else to add. <laughs> I totally agree with what Kelly and Tia just expressed. Um, but definitely, uh, I mean, sibling rivalry is everywhere in our household, especially now during this pandemic. I mean, we're getting on each other's nerves all the time. So, and it's, it's a time where we need to, um, 
as parents, we need to self-regulate our own emotions and what, what is it that we're going through as well. So, you know, we need to, when they are acting up and stuff, we need to notice it and, and, and rather than react to that behavior, see what is that unmet need that's behind that? What is it that they actually want? And, and have that conversation with them perhaps, you know? And all children, the main thing is that they want, they thrive on our connection. They want to be, they want to feel seen, they want to feel heard, they want to feel validated. So the minute there's a sibling rivalry, we're constantly like, you know, no, don't go, go to your room or we're, we're ready to react to it rather than just, you know, hold back and, you know, be maybe like a referee, calm down and just acknowledge both of them and empathize with both of them because they're both right in their own way and, and try to, try to connect with, with, what their needs are and, and move on from there. Yeah. So and I, I just wanted to add on to whatever Kelly and Tia just mentioned, because it is yeah. important that they, they're, they're noticed. Yeah. But what I heard you say that was different, that was really important. And I appreciate you bringing it up is self-regulation because what we know about our children, what we know about humans, but I'll just speak to our children in this case is that they co-regulate so that if our nervous system is really activated and we're super, you know, reactive to the situation and stressed out, they don't, they have an immature regulate, you know, uh, nervous system. So they need us to regulate to. And so if the only thing to regulate to is a, is a dysregulated nervous system, that's what they're going to regulate to. And so um, often what happens is parents co-regulate to their kids and they co-regulate to their kids. So they kind of down level <laughs> and they co-regulate to their dysregulated nervous system and join them in the conflict. And what I hear you saying is there's a way that we can have a tool, which is to breathe and to come to our own center and to kind of rise above it. And that doesn't mean like a power over, but to rise above so that we can see better. And so that we become the one holding for the kids, this whole situation saying like, listen, I'm the mama. I get this. I get that this is normal. I'm here to coach you to have a better, you know, better insight into yourself and to have an opportunity to co-regulate to me. Let me do this for you. So the co I think the regulation is, is key to the long-term strategy for how to, to manage sibling rivalry. Yeah. So Absolutely. what, and we get, sorry, and we get to model that for them so that they're able to deal with their own emotions and it's important this is where they need to interact in the, with other people around them afterwards yeah well so what do you guys do when you're in a situation where you do feel a little bit activated with when it's a sibling rivalry situation do you guys have any strategies for how you um get yourself to center in that moment anyone have any thoughts that they want to share i mean for me it's it's the inevitable pause you know, but that's so easy to say. And for people who don't know what a pause is or how to implement that, it does take time and it does take practice, um, which is why I encourage people to practice when things are going well. That's when you practice the pause. You don't practice in the heat of the moment because you don't have the skill set. You don't have the brain wiring for that. So the pause for me is a breath. And then it's also, um, again, with years of practice, I can do the deconstruction fairly to some level at least of understanding, you know, so it's like, okay, what are my expectations? Okay. So what's going on? What, you know, why is this hitting me? Why am I feeling, you know, why am I, is my lid starting to flip as for Dan Siegel? You know, so I can ask those questions internally as I'm breathing to help bring my regulation, get that self-regulation and then enter their space because until I'm there and something, and sometimes I don't even need to enter their space. Cause I'm like, you know what? They they're handling it just because the voices are getting louder doesn't mean they're not communicating. And so it's, but I can then attune to each of them and decide, is this a time where I step in or is this a time where just my calmer energy space can do that? So the pause and the breath, it's, and really there's so many ways to breathe, but it's at a bare minimum, have your exhale longer than your inhale. I mean, there's box breathing there's all, sorts of ways but the way to bring your nervous system back online and self-regulate longer exhale so yep. if there's anything you're gonna do inhale three or four exhale seven eight yep and practice practice yep. practice 
Right. And that engages the parasympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. So yeah, exactly. great. Yeah. What else do you guys do? I, I feel like what she was saying about the pause is so powerful. Cause like Shafali always says, there's so much power in the pause. And when I started, like Tia was saying, it was a, it was like a nanosecond. And now it's like, a couple seconds. So like mm -hmm. I've built years of going now, I'm almost like a couple minutes. I can kind of catch myself in the middle, but I also want to encourage parents to catch them when they're getting along and, and give them like a reinforcement, not like, isn't it so nice you guys are getting along? Wouldn't it be nice to have this all the time? That's kind of like a passive aggressive way of saying mm -hmm. it, but always catching them when they are getting along and be like, you guys get along so well. I love the way you guys figure out problems. I love the way you you, um, and then I love the way that you did blank. Like when there's conflict that one pl wanted to play basketball and the other one wanted to go swimming and they did a flip the coin. I'm like, that is so smart. I wish I would have done that when I was younger. Yeah. I wish I, like, I'm learning so much from you guys. That must feel so good to get along. So then it reinforces it that they're not doing it because mom and dad are proud, but it feels good within themselves yeah. to get along with their parents. I mean, get along with their siblings. Yeah. And then during the calm waters is a great time to teach them so it's more proactive like you versus reactive, like you all were saying, of like th them have this situation, respond. Then there's like, come at it more of a proactive way of like catching them when they're getting along and reinforcing it. So it feels good and that inner dialogue comes within themselves and also giving them strategies. Kids don't know how to get along sometimes. So teaching them things like what's a win-win um, when they're real young, instead of saying, can I have that? Can I have that for five minutes? Because one of the things that when sharing was a big deal with my kids when they were younger, my daughter was so good at sharing with her friends, but for some reason when it was her brother, she just was having such a hard time. I said, what's the difference? She said, I, I know with my friends that are in first grade that they're going to give it back to me, but I feel like if I give it back to my brother, if I give it to my brother, he's never going to give back to me. So just implementing that one little, can I have that for five minutes? changed everything because then it was that reassurance that you're going to get it back and then teaching them things like when they are going to a place that they're not comfortable with just saying please stop I don't like that and mm -hmm. those five words I used to teach my first graders please stop I don't like that it kind of lets them know that, like you're going into territory I don't approve and so you're teaching kids how to create boundaries and then that kind of alerts me that like there's something going on over here but I'm not the referee I always say I don't have my whistle and I don't have my stripes on today <laughs> I love the way you guys are so able to figure this out so when they come and tattle to me, especially when they were younger, I'm like, I can't wait to see how you figure this out, you guys. Mm -hmm. And having like a tattle box within the house, this is again, when they're younger, my nine and 12 year old would laugh me out of the house if I had a tattle box, but the tattle box to write things in there or draw pictures of things of what their brother or sister did to tattle on them in a positive way. Mm -hmm. So they're, so you're teaching the kids to kind of like look for the positive in each other. So if you have a tattle box and you've kind of retrained the word of tattle box, they're tattling on because they picked up their marker when it fell down. And then I read that in the box. I'm like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you did that. And so it kind of shifts it a little bit where they're on the same side. And I kind of see them nudging when they were younger. And I did this in the classroom too, where they were nudging each other. Like, look what I just did. Go put it in the tattle box. Because kids oh. want to get on that positive, <laughs> like that positive train, so to speak, not only with their siblings, but with their parents, they want to get along. Sometimes mm -hmm. they don't know how to. So mm -hmm. we kind of just expect they're just going to be born into the world. And they're going to know how to get along with all the people. They're always going to say, please. They're always going to say, thank you. They're never going to have any negative emotions. And so when they do have these things, they don't know what to do with it. So they say, what does mom do? What does dad do? That's what I'm going to do. Cause they don't know how to manage their stress. So sometimes yeah. if they're feeling a lot of stress, the first person, the easiest victim is the sibling. So yeah. when you kind of teach them what to do with stress and stress is part of the human experience and not to push it away. And there's nothing wrong with it. You don't have to ha hand over that hot potato of, stress to someone else yeah. and teaching them those coping strategies. And once I'm in alignment with myself, then that teaches them how to be in alignment with them, their own selves. Totally. Yeah. That is so great. I just want to call out, like, I love the positive orientation that you have mm -hmm. and I really love your strategies. They're just so fun. Like I, I, you know, truly Every, I, you are an incredibly creative person and like the tattle box and being a positive tattle box. That's so great. <laughs> and, but I want to call out that, you know, that's what I, a lot of times, like if you look at the, the mainstream kind of wisdom around, mm -hmm. um, sibling rivalry, it is like that they're not getting the attention and they're not getting mm -hmm. heard and that they want your attention. And often I think what we do is we, we try to solve that by spending time with them. 
which mm-hmm. is great. And I'm not discounting that we should spend one-on-one time with our kids, but you're, what you're proposing, and I know that this is what you know Tia and Terry believe in as well, is that no, no, no. This is actually just all the time. How mm-hmm. are we, how are we meeting our kids in relationship all the time? How are we, and that doesn't mean we're meeting every single need, every single moment of every single day. There are often things that they're, you know, we're encouraging them to meet their own needs or their, or each other's needs, but it's still a kind of like what I almost have is like, you have like a little radar that, you know, you're just kind of watching for these opportunities. You're watching for the opportunities to, to comment on what's doing, going well. You're, you know, Tia, you might mentioned like attuning, you're kind of attuning into like, when do you need to, to get engaged? When do you not? How can, and it's a little bit more of just an, an ever presence mm-hmm. and an, and an ever connection rather than, oh shoot, you know what? They're fighting a lot these days. I, I, this weekend, I'm going to take my kid to go do a thing. No, no, no. You have that opportunity every single moment mm-hmm. of every day. And I just appreciate you kind of highlighting mm-hmm. the and and it sounds like it's far more work, but it ultimately is so little work. It becomes part of our habit and it's self-fulfilling. Mm-hmm, it's self-fulfilling. For sure. Like, Kids are self-fulfilling prophecies. I tell them all right. the time how well they get along and they actually think they get along. So now they get along a lot of the times <laughs> because right. wherever your focus goes, your energy flows. Tony Robbins says that. And I'm now looking for when they get along. But if I'm always saying, oh, they're getting along, I wonder how long this is going to last in my mm-hmm. mind. But that's what the brain does. This, they're getting along. I wonder how long this is going to last. No, they're getting along and this is awesome. And I'm going to tell them how awesome it is. Not from yeah. a passive aggressive place, but like, thank you. This is awesome. I love being with you guys. You guys are yeah. such cool kids. And the way you get along, I wish I got along with my sister sometimes. Sometimes I was like the annoying little kid who always wanted the attention. I was like the yapping dog. <laughs> so it's so cool to see you guys acting like this and like just hanging out with each other. Yeah. And, they do, and they just kind of like let it sink in. They're not like, oh, thank you. You know, they're just, it just becomes a part of who they are. And then they mm-hmm. start to believe it. Yeah. And then they start to act, act accordingly. And totally. so they used to argue most of the time and now they get along most of the time. And when they do argue, I don't flip out because I know that they have strategies. And like, if I need to intervene, then I need to intervene. But that's so few and far between mm-hmm. because they just know that like, you're on my side, I'm on your side. How can we figure this out together? And there's lots of times where I hear them doing conflict and they're like, okay, do you want to flip a coin or do you want to... Um, flip a pillow or do you want to do rock? I they do rock, paper, scissors all the time mm-hmm. yep. or I'll see them on, they pretend like they're on shark tank. And then I'm like, okay, this is, they'll be like, okay, this is my deal. And like, no, I got to counter with this. And so they're now have this, like re, re, this, and they see my husband and I doing that too. Cause I'll be like, well, I want to do this. And he's like, well, I got to do this. I'm like, well, I'll, I'll do this. I'll do the laundry. If you do the, if you do the dishes and he's like, I'll counter with, you know? And so it's done in a fun, playful way, not in, okay, let's sit down. Let's have a family meeting. She did this. He did this. It's like, how can we model this over and over and over? And what are they seeing in me? Because in the, in the end, that's all I really can control is myself and my yep. side of the street. So when I focus on my side of the street, I'm not so focused on their side of the street. So I'm always thinking of like, what am I bringing? How am I modeling this with my husband? And how am I modeling this with my son? So my daughter's picking up on it. Not like, oh, come here and watch me. But she's picking up on that. What's the energy in the home? Like one of you were saying, or all of you were saying is, energy is very contagious. So the energy we're bringing to the table is what they're going to absorb from us. So if we are like all out of alignment all the time, then they're going to kind of feel like a little out of alignment. And they're just like, they're like the quicker picker upper bounty towels. They absorb (laughs) all of our energy and whatever energy we're bringing to the table, they're going to reflect back to us. And I don't want parents to use that reflection of the way to beat themselves up, but as a way of having data to see behavior as a language to us of how are they teaching us where I need to grow? not from a place of beating myself up, but from a place of involvement. And that's where conscious parenting comes in because it's like, what are you here to teach me? I'm just going to focus on my side of the street over here. And you guys, you guys know what to do. And so you kind of give them that confidence, and that autonomy, and they want that. They want control of their own life. So you're giving that to them in, in, in essence. Yeah, totally. Thank you. That, that was so great. That's, mm-hmm. that's so fun. It's so fun just to listen to you. You know, your, your energy is infectious. I think all of us want to live in your house. <laughs> <laughs> But I think it's great. And I just, but I, but I think that, you know, even everyone's going to have their own style. They're not going to be 
they they might not have some of the you know natural inclination to see the positive, but it mm -hmm. is something that it's a practice and it's a habit, and we shift our orientation. You know, humans do have a natural negative orientation, mm -hmm. so it it is something that we have to practice and set the intention. You know, every day, and not to set mm -hmm. twenty things that you're going to do, just one thing. You know, and mm -hmm. practice, practice until that becomes part of your life. Is that you're looking at your kids and having a positive orientation, and you know, you probably need the parent probably needs to have a tattle box too, yeah. you know, right. right? In the yeah. beginning, the parent needs a tattle box to put those positive things that they see happening too, just because it's a shift that we have to make. Yeah. Yeah. We have 60,000 thoughts a day and 80% of them default to the negative without mind management. So yeah. that's mm -hmm. huge. And 95% of those thoughts are unconscious thoughts. Conscious yeah. living and conscious work is so hard, but sleeping with mommy guilt is so much harder and not being so the parent harder. and having all that chaos and stress within the home is so much harder. So this is work that is like, it's all about digging within our own stuff, but not from a place, like I said, of beating ourselves up, but from a place of compassion and love. Yeah. Because when we see ourselves with compassion and love, then we can just project that onto our kids. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Terry, what do you have to add to this oh about? God, I don't know. <laughs> well, what I, let me be specific about it. I would love to know what you do or what you have done in the past to get yourself centered in a, in a moment um, when you are caught, when you feel like you're kind of caught off guard by their behaviors. Is there something you do? Do you have ways that you do that? Yeah. Just like Tia mentioned, I, I often come to my pause. I come to my breath right away. Um, but at the beginning, I used to have a hard time coming to my breath. I didn't, you know, so oftentimes I would do little things like just go get a glass of water mm -hmm. and that would be my pause. And I would just drink this water and it will allow me to like, just calm down in a, in a certain ways before, uh, approaching the children and trying to figure out what to do. And I also would not always tend to them. I mean, mm -hmm. if they would be fighting, I would just like try not like I used to have a tendency of right away going to them and saying, you know, stop doing this or stop doing that. But I would step away now and try to let them figure it out on their own. And most of the time they would be able to figure it out on their own. The only time I would just intervene is they would, if they would be physically getting active in that, then I would, you know, really put myself in there. But, um, and I would try to, you know, really separate them and acknowledge always both of them which was very hard to do at times because i you know i always we try not to label our children or either pick any side and try to keep it as equal as possible because we don't want to pick any sides because uh, it, it'll it makes them just feel worse and create more shame uh, towards them so uh yeah i try to the pause is the most important thing really is to just stay at that pause and then try to self-regulate yourself and be able to uh, approach them afterwards. Yeah. Thank you. I know. I, and it is so hard. It's like, uh, like if we could get the magic, if we could have a magic wand to get people to find that pause, but it is a practice, but I will tell you a couple things that, and then I'd love to hear, you know, you guys that from your earliest stage, like if you're giving advice to somebody who's listening to this, who's in the middle of all of it, like what you would do first. And I'll give something first, just to start off with when I, um, when I was starting to see that what I was doing with sibling rivalry was not working and that I was intervening and I was being one of those, I was definitely, I tried so hard not to pick sides, but I always did kind of feel like, well, one was getting ripped off and whatever. And, you know, and so um, I learned, I read this book and I don't know if you guys read the book, Siblings Without Rivalry. Yes. Love it's that such book. a good book and I highly recommend it to people. It's not that I even agree with every single thing in it. There are mm -hmm. some things that I'm like, yeah, that just seems a, like a little off. But for the most part, it still just sets us up to look at sibling rivalry differently. And um, I remember the, the idea of sports casting. Mm -hmm. And that was what gave me my pause in the beginning. So rather than me intervening with you know, oh, Josh, don't, don't do that. Wait, uh, you, uh, it, it, you know, like that kind of stuff. I would walk in the room and I'd say, I see two boys who are fighting over a toy and I 
you know, see one of them is really upset and the other one seems like he's laughing, you know, and I just would sportscast what I was seeing rather than putting a, an assessment. I guess that was a little bit of an assessment, but you know, um, you know, and, and that would give me, it wasn't as much for them. I mean, it did impact them because they were able to be like, what, that's what we're doing. You know, there was a, <laughs> there was a way that that did happen, but it was more the process to calm my nervous system down, to get out of my judging mind and into just what do I see right now? Mm -hmm. And it would just bring me, so I think that's one strategy for people who are in the beginning of this, who are just like, what do I do? Like, this is great. I want what you're talking about, mm -hmm. but what do I do now? So as we wrap up today, which I can't believe how fast time goes by, but um, <laughs> that's okay. You guys are great. And we have three more, two more panels. So we have six more people that will contribute their beautiful, amazing ideas here. But what do you guys, what would you in, ask, invite people to do if they were in the beginning of this journey? This is like painful for them right now. And they're kind of going like, no, 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 but you need to give me something to give me relief this minute. I'd love for um, Terry, if you would start and just share, like, what would you advise people to do right now? Well, the first thing for sure is once they start hearing their children uh, acting out is really self-regulate yourself and not react to their, their situation. So just a no notice and accept and allow the feelings, but don't react to them. Just And also accept the children's big emotions that they're expressing and have compassion for them mm -hmm. and, and allow them to to help them with it so they can self-regulate also their emotions and just be there with them. And that's by doing so, you're creating a connection also with them at the same time. And that is what the children really are thriving for is they want, wanting that connection from us. I sometimes feel the sibling rivalries that are happening in our homes. I sometimes just an attempt, a, a, just a way to get our attention and mom, I want you to come here, you know? And then we get there and we start to pick sides, right? If you usually, you know, we tend to always side on, uh, get upset with the older one because we expect that our older child should know better yeah. and should be acting better, but it doesn't happen that way, right? They're both children. We need to look at them. We need to look at them at their, in their view, right? And there, there's something that's going on in their world and we need to look at it from their point of view and take it from there mm -hmm. and, and show them and guide them with it. And then that's when we start to coach them into their, um, their, their emotions, you know, and help, help them self-regulate and teach them how to negotiate the things. And that's part of it. So we rivalry is part of our development. We need to, they need to know this. And another thing I wanted to add was that oftentimes we often blame the older child for, uh, for things because we expect the older one to know better, right? But you know what? They don't know any better because the prefrontal cortex doesn't, it's underdeveloped. It only gets developed later on, I think, in their mid twenties or something. Mm -hmm. That's what I heard. So I mean, it's 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 they don't know how to reason and 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 have some logic into all this. So we need to guide them and teach them how to how to do that. Yeah, thank you for that. And I really appreciate what you're saying. Is that the first step for people is to to you know first it's to self regulate. And so that could be through breath and, you know, some mechanism, drinking a glass of water or something, but it's also to really look at this and, and have compassionate compassion for our kids and to understand, you know, we, I, I think the other orientation that you're inviting people to shift on is shift away from the need to fix something and just look at this as an opportunity to connect and understand your kids a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So thank you. That was really good. Good. Great. Um, entry point for people. Yeah. So Tia, how about you? I think that was great. And then the frontal cortex, I think is a really important part because we have to take in the science that we now have. And so understanding, you know, they may have the ability of right and wrong and the ability of reasoning when their frontal cortex is online, when they're in a parasympathetic mode, but when they're in that rip sibling rivalry, that conflict, that's when it goes out the window, just like it does for us. So we have to remember we can reason and have these conversations, but in the moment, they might not be able to access that. And that is okay. So, you know, just as an understanding point of view, <clears throat> excuse me. And then I think another couple things I just do want to point out, and then I'll add in my little tip, but um, it's never too late. 
you know, I mean, Kelly was able to bring this in at such a beautiful young age and work on yourself and that like the tattle box, all of that. I didn't learn these skills till my children are, were preteen, preteens. So that stuff wouldn't have worked with them. So it's recognizing it's never too late. Um, you, there is always room for growth, always room for connection, always room for working through the rivalry, depending upon how it's showing up and using those tools. Just like Kelly said, the tattle box wouldn't work now with her older kids. They would laugh about it. Um, so just knowing that it's never too late. And then also, you know, building on when you're in that conflict, what tools can you bring in? It's, I think another important thing is prevention. Um, you know, do the conflicts tend to happen right before dinner time or around bedtime? Mm. You know, so can we take a step back and kind of just go into observation and curiosity mode um, and let go of the need to fix in the moment? Take three, four days and just watch. See mm. when, especially now with quarantine, we're all stuck at home. When are these conflicts showing up most likely? Is it around, you know, it's school's work time and they don't want to do their online schooling. Is it around that? Is it around lunchtime? Is it around... So you can start to potentially see some patterns of they might be more tired. They might be more hungry. What are those needs? And then you can kind of step in and do some prevention and acknowledge, Hey, you know, remember this time yesterday, you know, it sounds like it's a good time. Maybe take a break from each other. Hey, let's all go to our little respective own spaces and take some time to, rebalance ourselves, you know, whatever language you want to use. So there's that prevention piece. And then the last piece I want to add is, is our children are not us. Mm -hmm. They're not us. And they may handle conflict differently than we do. Um, and I'll just share a personal example. I can't remember the exact age. Maybe it was 13, 14 years old. I don't, I don't recall exactly. But I remember my daughters were having quite a heated conflict. <laughs> Mm -hmm. To the point where I'm like, I think I'm going to go upstairs. And so I regulated myself, went up and they're in one of their bedrooms, literally just, you know, from my point of view, it was like, boy, you're just going for the jugular and you're going for the jugular. You know, it was unpleasant to say the least. And I said something and one of my daughters stopped. It was amazing. She literally stopped in the middle of their argument and looked at me and goes, mom, you know what? You might not like how we're handling it, but this is how we're handling it right now. And you need to not get involved. And it was like, literally like the mirror up in my face. It's like, she's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just because I didn't like how they were handling it, mm -hmm. that particular conflict, like that particular moment, that particular day, that was what they needed with each other. And by golly, when I, I literally stopped, <laughs> And I don't even know if I said okay or anything. And I just left. And within two or three minutes, they had figured it out and they were getting along again. And it was such mm -hmm. a learning moment for me that my way isn't always right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so recognizing, taking that step back. And sometimes the conflict, they may get along and figure it out with collaboration and beauty and all of that. And there's other times it may not look like that way. Mm -hmm. And again, it's that attuning. <laughs> and if you're lucky enough to have a child who is willing to say, hey, <laughs> you need to back off right now. Listen, because yeah. the magic may happen if you just let it unfold. So, but that's sitting with your own discomfort as well. So recognizing that, but you know, to what to use today, building on what everyone else is saying, look at prevention. Yeah. See what I, you can do at, before the conflict arises. Yeah. That's really important. I think you're totally spot on. And I think one thing about this, I just want to, I just want to call out um, that it, this idea of, you know, you separating yourself from them and knowing that they are, they're going to maybe navigate things differently, you know, it does require some humility. And oh, yeah. yeah. And, you know, and I think that sometimes can be really hard for us because, you know, we've sort of been told we're supposed to be like the, the boss and we need to be in charge. We need to know, you know, know everything. And so there's, you know, some humility when they say that. And I want to just give you a little bit more credit than you're giving yourself here about that's not just luck that your kids are, are able to speak up to you like that. It's actually because you created an environment where there's the psychological safety, where they know they can actually say that to you and that they, you are going to actually hear them and that some that you'll be impacted by them then in, in in such a way that you're going to let them have their voice they're going to have their you know their thoughts on it so just i want to just acknowledge that it's not just luck you know yeah you know, yep. I think it was more luck until i have met more and more conscious parents and parents who follow you know attachment theory and 
um, and see that actually there is a difference in the families, like a stark contrast in the families who are implementing conscious parenting and attachment theories compared to parents who aren't. And I, and I really did believe that maybe we were just lucky, but I don't, it's can't, it's can't be possible. I know it's anecdotal and I'm only just basing it on, you know, 25 conscious parent coaches that I know or something, but I see it over and over again. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of more, like a little more credit than you'll give yourself. Cause I know you're being humble. <laughs> well, thank you. I do appreciate it. I mean, it, it was a gift. It's wonderful. Right. So that's the, that is a really big shift is when we can look at what our kids say to us, the most jarring things that our kids say to us are often the best gifts that they can give us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That was really helpful. Thank you so much. So, um, yeah. So Kelly, um, your thoughts on person sitting there going, Kelly, I, I, love, I know I love all these answers and you're helping me so much to conjure up all like my daughter who just walked in. She's the one who was the one that wake me up because she was such a truth teller and she still is to this day at 12. And I'm always going to her and saying, where can I improve? What are you seeing in me? I want to know my blind spots. I want to be triggered by my kids so I can be triggerless. And I want my ego to be at the door. So every single day, because the ego, I didn't even know what the ego was before conscious parenting. I thought the ego was someone who worked on wall street and thought they were too hot to try. <laughs> yeah, and I was like the exact yeah. opposite. I was yeah. coming in this parenting journey. Like I'm going to mess this up. I can't mess this up. Oh my gosh. What if I mess this up? What if they have to go to therapy? La, la, la. Like all this yeah. fear was in this parenting journey. Whereas as a teacher and a counselor, I had no fear. I had no ego. Mm. And so I always love the way Shafali has taught us that they didn't come from us. They came through us and they can never push our buttons. We're the ones that put the buttons there and the buttons are just rooted in fear. And yeah. so I want my kids to push my buttons so I can see what's underneath and see the wiring. And we also have to remember that we are working with kids that like Easter just passed and they, there was Easter eggs all over our backyard. And my nine and a half year old, almost 10, literally thought a bunny like through this Corona dropped them all. Like they believe in such like 10 and under, we are not working with our coworkers. We have to remember that we're not dealing with a fully developed brain of a human and not to cut them down, but it's the most beautiful thing. That's the, that's the joy of the holidays is the kids and they bring out the magic in all of us. And instead of always is asking them to come to our world and like be an adult and say please and say thank you. And what are you going to be when you grow up? How about asking them, who do you want to be when you grow up? What do you like? What traits do you want? Let, let me learn from you because that little girl is still living inside of us. And so instead of always asking them to come to our world, let's go to their world and see mm -hmm. what's going on. Because we mm -hmm. ask our kids so much to do this and brush your teeth and do this. And they ask us so much to do things. How much are we listening to them when they want to play the board games or they want to go for a walk or they want to play volleyball or whatever it is at their age, where they want to go painting, whatever, sidewalk chalk, whatever it is, <coughs> let's go into their world a little bit more than expecting them to come to our world because our world is kind of like boring and stale. Their world <laughs> is filled with magic and rainbows and unicorns. And that's what I love about kids is that they remind us of who we used to be. And so when we can go into that world, we can kind of understand their world a little bit better and understand the world from their goggles versus our goggles. And like Tia and Terry, and you were saying too, Deb, of like seeing life from their point of view versus always seeing it from our point of view, because their way might be different, but it might be actually better. Yeah. So my daughter actually it <laughs> defines her life into two parts, life before conscious parenting as awful and stressful, which it was. And then life after conscious parenting is awesome and just chill, which it is <laughs> because conscious parenting is so much freedom because you just drop the ego at the door. It's yeah. such an easier way to parent because you're coming at it from like, okay, what are you here <laughs> to teach me? And like, I know there's parts of me where I need to grow. So just show me and you're your own throbbing spirit. And I don't need you to become a mini me. I need you to become a mini version of yourself. And then let me just watch and just coach you and just like watch you from the sidelines versus what I was doing before I was, I was on the field with them. I was like, all right, here's your play. Do this, do this, do this. And some kids will be super compliant but then they can't really think for themselves. And then there's other kids who are super pushed back and they're like, I love you, but I need my own throbbing spirit. I need you to go mm -hmm. sit in the stands right now. Mm -hmm. I need you to go on the sidelines because your energy is just too much for me right now. Mm -hmm. And so once I was able to get out of the way and get detach my ego and see them almost as a student in my classroom, then I was like, oh, this is part of the human experience. I can sit in the sidelines and sit in the stands and learn from them versus me being on the field going, here's your playbook, let's go. Because when I tried to do that, it was always, there was always fouls on the play. But when I'm in the stands, I'm just kind of cheering them on. I'm like, yes. And then when there's a foul on the play, I'm like, oh, next time we'll just try to do it better. 
because I'm on their side and it's me with them versus me against them, which is what they felt before. Uh, yeah. So it's great. So it kind of goes a little bit to prevention. You know, yes. again, it's like, you know, what can you be doing? How can you enter their world? How can you be in, how can you proactively be connecting with them, doing the fun things that they want to do, let them teach mm-hmm. you. But also I, I really think it's important. Like, I think a lot, this might be hard for people to hear, but like you welcoming the trigger, I always feel yes. like it's like, you know, come on, bring it on, bring it on. You know, yes. I used to joke and I would say, I haven't been triggered in a really long time. That's a big <laughs> mistake. If you don't really want to be triggered, don't ever say that yes. because the next day you'll be like, whoa, like, again, right. like what? But, you know, but to, to invite the trigger is a, is a foreign concept for a lot of people, but it's like, you know, do you want to live a peaceful life with less suffering? Well, then you have to invite the trigger and then you mm-hmm. have to kind of deal with that right in that moment and, you know, work through that. Actually, you deal Dr. with Sh- Dr. Oh, Shafali said at one of her events that evolved, she said, you know, that no one can ever push your buttons. And I was like, I almost fell out of my chair. It was like, I was hit I by a lightning bolt. I was like, does she, has she met my husband and kids? And that was early on. <laughs> my, I was like, are you kidding? what I, I was blown away by that by that fact because I thought it was me against them and I was like oh so just keep opening yourself up and keep opening yourself up because it's always rooted in fear and it's usually rooted from like old pain or like we're gonna mess yeah. this up and I always tell my kids I'm like I'm gonna mess this up a little bit and that's okay yeah. I just want to be a b minus mom I don't want to be the perfect mom because I tried that for years and I was exhausted and it felt very imperfect because I was like this all the time and now I'm like, I just want to be B minus. Yeah. Like that's going you know, on. Sometimes I'm CD, sometimes I'm AB, but like in the end, I want my average to be a B minus, which allows the kids to be B minus and mess up and have mm-hmm. flaws and be flossom at the same time. And then it doesn't put so much pressure on them that they have yeah. to be and do and wear all these masks. And like, who does mom want to be, me to be? I'm like, I don't want you to be anybody. I just want mm-hmm. you to show up and let's just hang out together. So there's not this pressure of that. They have to get the A or get the goal or get the home run. Or like, I just want to hang out with you because you're a beautiful spirit that mm. doesn't belong to me. And you just came through me, but yep. you didn't come from me. Love it. That's so great. You guys are awesome. You have so much to say. I just want to like, I want to leave everyone with one thought, which is what Kelly just said. It's one of my favorite things is just to be flossom. Yep. <laughs> like, <laughs> go, go be flossom and let your kids be flossom. And, uh, you know, it, it's great. Thank you to, to all of you. This has been so insightful, so much wisdom in packed into less than an hour, which is amazing. And I just thank you all very much for being here. Thank Thanks you for having us. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this series, the sibling rivalry panel. And if you didn't get a chance to watch all three, find them. There are three in this series and they are on the parenting playlist of Inside Out Activism. And I hope that if you like it, that you will click the like button and that you will also click subscribe and the little bell next to it so you'll be notified of new videos that come through here. A couple other things we'd love for you to do is we'd love for you to share these videos. If you found them to be helpful, please share them with other people. I mean, who isn't, what parent isn't dealing with sibling rivalry, at least to some degree? And so if you can share them with other people, I really believe it's just a great contribution to, to um, society, to, to all. We all created this out of the goodness of our hearts because we are passionate about helping and supporting parents. And so the best thing that you could be doing is sharing with other people so that we spread the word, more people get the support they they need. And then ultimately, it is the way that we are going to, one of the ways that we will make a better world, change society, create a better better homes and better families and uh, more peaceful homes for people. So please pass it along to other people. If you have any questions for us, you can actually just engage in the comments below, either on Facebook or on the YouTube channel. You can engage in the comments. Our coaches that have been part of the panel will um, be happy to respond to you, give you some, some feedback. Please do that as well. And um, make sure you check out the show notes. In the show notes, I've included the bios of each of these individuals. They have all been so generous to give their time to us to engage in this discussion. Check out their bios, go to their websites, check them out, see if there's, if you have any interest in working with them or working with me and getting an additional level of support that might really help to shift things in your home. So thanks so much again and uh, stay tuned in. We would love to see you back here checking out more videos. Thanks so much.